connection. Our session this morning is staying connected to the culture. And uh, specifically, we want to talk about dealing with millennials. We want to be dealing, we want to talk about dealing with those who have been born between 1981 and 2001, and uh, now 15 to 35 years of age, somewhere in there. Most of our churches are seeing a number of these people leave for various reasons, but some churches are effectively reaching them. And our speaker this morning is one of our very own from Salem, Oregon. Bruce and his wife, Linda, have been lead pastors of Church on the Hill in Salem for the past six years. Interestingly enough, they have been on staff there since 2001. Before pastoring in Oregon, Bruce and Linda and their two sons served as missionaries for 16 years, mostly in southern Mexico, but they ministered all throughout Latin America. Bruce has worked uh, for two years with the Oregon Community Foundation as the director of Latino Partnership Project in Marion and Polk Counties. They both became believers when the gospel was shared with them uh, on the streets in California back in, in the late 1970s. Their church is a multi-site ministry with two campuses in the city. In addition to that, they have a Spanish-speaking congregation, a K-12 through Christian school. Their passion is focused, and I, and I know this to be true because when we're home, my wife and I get to attend that church. Their passion is focused on discovering, developing, and deploying potential, the potential of emerging new leaders of this generation. One of their life's verses is Psalms 135, verse 14. Your name, Lord, endures forever. Your renown, Lord, through all generations. Please welcome me as I ask Bruce Stefanik to join me here on the platform. Or welcome him, I should say. Thank you, Bruce. So I've set a timer here. When it goes off, we have four minutes. Okay, well, we'll have four more minutes to kind of wrap up. And, uh, you know, Bruce, I know that you guys have, have the two campuses, you know, both in the Salem area. One is Salem. Those of you who know the Salem-Kaiser area, one is in Salem on the south side. One is in the north end in, in Kaiser. In 2010, in a joint effort with the Oregon Ministry Network, you guys launched the second campus. You basically said, we have a vision to expand in our city, in our area. The Oregon Ministry Network said, we have a facility, and let's see if we can partner with you. Uh, tell me a little bit about what's happened since then, maybe an overview of, of uh, particularly that north campus, but the, the, you know, kind of the attendance and, and the age of the people that attend, and just to kind of set the stage for this morning. We, uh, yeah, we went into this uh, probably backing up a year and a half or so around end of 2008, and Pastor Lee and the, the network approached us. Uh, we were looking for a building. Our uh, funny thing is neither one of our churches, neither one of our campuses are actually in Salem. One's in Turner, one's in Kaiser. Our Turner campus is all the way on the south end of, the, of, the, of Salem, 248 exit. And then so we had a vision to get into the north side of the city, they had a building that needed to be used, and so in 2008 and 9, we began to build a team. It took us about a year to really get that team in place, but our vision was to reach the ethnic community. It's about 45% Hispanic, the area around the church, and then also it was a young community. Um, Kaiser's kind of a funny bedroom community, maybe to Portland and other places, and, and so, um, yeah, that's, we, we took about a year and then launched January of uh, 2010. And since then, you've seen uh, tremendous growth. I mean, uh, talk to us about the North Campus. And I, and I say that specifically because here was a church where we had struggled for a while. It had good days in the past, but more recently, things had been challenged. And, uh, and it was a point where the congregation was small, much like what we've seen on the screen up here. And yet God has done some great things. And talk to us about the age of the people attending that particular campus. Yeah, I don't know if it's just because it's an 11 o'clock service or what, yeah. but... Uh, we just, for some reason, right from the get-go, we had just a ton um, of 20-somethings of uh, that, that formed a core, really, and, and kind of they attracted others. And, and then there were a number of changes. It was, all, it was during this time that we transitioned into the lead pastor role. There was all kinds of things going on in the background, but um, again, it just something resonated, and we really had a sense that God was wanting to do something among uh, what we would call the, that millennial generation, and it's proved to be true. It's um, we maybe run four or five hundred on a Sunday out there, um, and f right now we're probably running about sixty-five percent are in their twenties of that four or five hundred, and so it's created. Sometimes it feels like 
I think it was you came out to speak one day and you said, I feel like I walked into a frat party or something. It's like, it's very noisy, it's very loud, uh, but it's, it's a lot of fun. There's some really, really cool stuff going on. Yeah, it's been exciting. You know, when it comes to the subject of millennials, we hear a lot of different questions out there and you, there are statements made like, why are so many young people leaving the church or how can I get more millennials into my church is a question often asked in a setting like this or... What about all those statistics that we hear that millennials are really difficult to reach? And, you know, they, they, uh, another thing that is often said is they seem like a bunch of entitled whiners <laughs> living a prolonged adolescence. And uh, some of you, um, I, I didn't say that. I've heard that. I'm just saying. I'm just saying, okay, those millennials in here, that, of course, doesn't apply to you, but, uh, but to others. But... You know, there's a, there's a lot of those things out there. In a few minutes, I'd like you to respond maybe to, to how you feel about that, Bruce. And then we have some specific questions. But I read a book recently, uh, Hayden Shaw, uh, Generational IQ. If you haven't read that book, it's a phenomenal book. But I love what he states right from the beginning because his opinion is Christianity isn't dying. Millennials aren't the problem, and the future is bright. I know because I get to attend your church that that's your feeling, but, but just comment on this. I mean, are they really that hard to reach, Bruce? Are they, are, uh, do you agree that they're leaving the church in, you know, in record numbers? Is there hope? Just, just comment a little bit on it before we get to some specific questions. Well, obviously, I don't agree with that. And um, I, I think sometimes uh, it's interesting, a little backstory. Uh, I, uh, Part of Salem has a number of large churches, and there's a bunch of us as pastors, both in the assemblies and outside. In fact, most of them are outside. We get together once a month. So the pastors are the largest churches in town in a smattering of medium and small, and there's about 25 of us that meet. And we were all together uh, right before Christmas, and we were talking. We just get together to pray. We don't plan anything or sell anything. We just get together to pray. And um, we were all talking, and someone asked me, they said, hey, when did you become a believer? I said, oh, 1978. My wife and I had become believers, got saved off of a street ministry in Northern California, just, just cold evangelism, just up front, on the street, sharing the gospel. So we're a product of street evangelism, and we were millennials at that time. That term wasn't around yet, but we were, we were 23 at that time. And uh, so we would, we would have been the Gen Xers, the hippies, right, that, that came from the traditionalists. And, um, and, and the guy that asked me the question said, wow, that's crazy. I got saved in 1980. And then someone else chimed in. It turned out of the 20 people or 25 people in that room, like 80% of us had all become believers between 1975 and 1985. We're talking those pastors represent thousands of people in, in the Salem community, thousands of people. And I thought to myself, isn't that interesting? Because back then... They were, my parents were saying the same thing about us that we're saying about the millennials. Oh, you sleep all day and get a real job, stop dreaming, you know, get down to earth. Uh, and, and every generation criticizes the generation coming behind as being weaker than they are. That's just, that's how that works, isn't it? But I think for us, we began to see that, listen, if God did that back then, why wouldn't he do that again? I mean, is God really limited by the statistics that somebody writes about what generations are doing? And I think even the word millennials, I think we have to be careful how we use that word. It's not found in the Bible, obviously, but the Bible has tons to say about reaching the next generation. Psalm 145, Psalm 87, Psalm 135 all talk about. I will not hide the wonderful works of the Lord from the generation coming behind me. And I think we have to see it with potential rather than cynicism. Or, or we become, we're, we're kind of dead in the water. I wonder if, and I know we've had conversations leading up to this, and one of our conversations centers around the topic that perhaps the millennia, millennials are not the problem. <laughs> Maybe there's a deeper problem. <clears throat> I, <laughs> well, most of the room in here is gray, so, <laughs> I mean, seriously, so, you know, in, uh, we know, don't we, as men and women of God, that if we have a problem, the problem is not on God's end, because God doesn't change, that's, a, that's an anchor for our soul, but we also know that the problem is on our end and that we need to change to catch up with what God is doing. That's called repentance, isn't it? And that's a difficult pill sometimes for us to swallow. Man, Phyllis was, was preaching it here, wasn't she, this morning. 
And um, I really think that the key is not somewhere in the millennials. Uh, we want to invest in them and release them, of course. But I think the key is in those of us who are on the stage today. And that involves some brutal honesty, I think, with ourselves. Honesty is the beginning of change, isn't it? Now listen, I want to say that again. Honesty is the beginning of change. Again, that's called repentance. That's when God is freed up to work, and that's when God steps in and does far more than we could ever ask or think or imagine. Um, and sometimes it's, it's an honesty that's a little bit, uh, that's anchored, in, or, or the dishonesty, the problem is anchored in rebellion, but sometimes it's just anchored in, in ignorance to some degree. And uh, uh, there, uh, if I tell you a quick little story that opened my eyes to this, um, a number of years ago, we were, my wife and I were living in southern Mexico. We'd been down there uh, quite a few years already. And um, uh, we were in a church service, and it was about this size, maybe a little bit bigger. And uh, the guest speaker was an American guy. Now, Mexico is kind of a unique place to minister because you can get there fairly easily. You can be on the mission field, like, overnight. And so you get a lot of Americans that would come down, and, and, and they didn't have time to learn the language, and they didn't feel like they needed it because they had a gardener who was Mexican, or they ate a Taco Bell all the time. So they felt like they were already in the, you know, they were in the flow of things. And, um, and so uh, this service, this, this older gentleman was up there, and they'd asked him before, brother, would you like a translator? He said, no, 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 I, I got this. And, and so he got started uh, preaching, and he, he did okay. I mean, he had the basics, but he... He lacked a little bit of the fine points as far as the Spanish language. And anyway, he was going at it, and it was understandable. And he got to the end of his message, and he was, he'd was he come a long ways, and he wasn't going to end that service without an altar call because that would not have been successful. And so he uh, he got to the end of the service, and he wanted to pray for people. And he said, he said uh, I, in Spanish, he said, Quiero que todos los, and he wanted to say, Los adultos pasen para acá. He said, I want to pray for all the adults. I want all the adults. And, you know, there was women and children and men there. I want them all to come forward. He was going to have an altar time. And, and when he said that, no one really moved. Everybody just kind of put their head down. But what he had actually said, he just added one little diphthong that changed everything. He said, I want, quiero que todos los adulteros, which means I want all the adulterers to come forward. <laughs> and, I, and I want to pray for you. And, and, and so he... Uh, he said it once, and when everybody put their head down and no one knew it, he said, well, I'm, I'm going I'm to keep drilling here. And so he said it again, and he said it again. And finally, this one old guy just comes walking up. <laughs> one guy right here just. And they had a glorious time of reconciliation and repentance. <laughs> Our staff is falling off the chair in the back. Just No, I thought, you know. What's wrong with that? <laughs> you think about that. He did not, this, this guy, this, this man of God did not lack sincerity. And he didn't lack the right message. But he lacked something. He, he had lost the ability to hear what he sounded like. He was out of touch with his audience. He had, the bridge between his audience had, it was non-existent. And, and, I, and I think that's what I'm after here is that... Um, he didn't lack sincerity. You know, God bless Phyllis and that generation. Um, it, it was real then. It, God moved. God was, was, was changing lives. But like she was saying, and there was, there's a new language that needed to be learned if we were going to be. And somehow I think we describe that maybe as being missional. Uh, what that means is, is that we have this ability, and this is hard for all of us, all of us. We have this difficulty in, in laying down our culture Whatever that be, our age culture, our, our church culture, our denominational culture, our American culture, in order to enter the world of another. And uh, unless we do that, it's always going to be us and them. Uh, they're not going to feel welcome, these millennials, unless, they're, unless they're, that bridge is built uh, effectively. I really think we're going to be at a disadvantage. And we're going to keep drilling. We'll keep doing our services. We'll keep We'll have the same trappings. We'll, we'll have, you know, we, we know what this culture looks like, don't we? Right? I mean, come on now. We know what Christian culture feels like, the secret handshakes, and everybody knows what's going on in the vocabulary. And, and all. But there's a ton of people out there that have been away from the church for 10 or 15 years, folks. And that culture has passed on. I want to honor it. I want to remember it. But listen, it, it's a new day, and we have to come to grips with that, or, or we're just going to just fizzle and, and rather than be poised to hand that baton to the next generation. So.
that's my rant, sorry. <laughs> no, I think it's good. So um, as, as leaders, most everyone in the room here are leaders and pastors. What kinds of questions should we be asking uh, when it comes to reaching millennials? Yeah, I think sometimes the question sounds like, what can I do to get those guys in my church? When, um, and, and that's not a, ter a terrible question, but I think sometimes, like I was saying earlier, the question should be, what does God want to change in me that those kinds of people would be attracted to me, that would want to come near me? You know what I mean? And, and those sound similar, but they're, they're actually very, very different. And, and so this, this, this thing of, where, what, is, what is my faith level? You know, in the Old Testament, in, in the Exodus, God charged Pharaoh, a whole generation, for his idolatry and stubbornness. But we can't forget that God also charged the Hebrew nation, an entire generation, for their unbelief and unwillingness to follow. The same God charged both the heathen and his own people, a whole generation, because they refused to believe. And so sometimes we listen to the statistics of, oh, the millennials are leaving, or they're unreachable, or they're, they're, you know, they're unchurched. Or, or, and, and, and sometimes I think, well, do we have more faith in, I mean, where is the level of our faith? That's where we have to, have to begin is, do we really believe that God could move in this generation? And you look around, and there's a whole bunch of circumstances that would cause you to be maybe cynical or whatever. But, but come on, folks. We were saved. We were saved in the, in the Jesus movement. And, man, the hippies back then were doing all kinds of gnarly things that everybody thought the Antichrist was just around the corner, right? I mean, how many people did we hear were the Antichrist and, and, and this world's just going to hell in a handbasket and it, it, we've been around 30-some years and it still hasn't. Come on. So every generation has a struggle of sin and what the enemy's doing, but God is always up to something. There's always a redemptive peace in every generation. And we have to tap into that. Where is that? But if we're all we're doing is Christian culture and our own speaking to ourselves in a vacuum, man, it could, it could just pass us right by. So what do I need to do to begin to listen with new ears? And, of course, that's going to involve listening to people, like Phyllis was saying, that I'm not, I'm not comfortable with. I'm learning a different language. I'm listening to something that's not as, as easy to listen to. So what are some of the uh, practical challenges? You listen, you, you've decided you're going to uh, intentionally reach into these different cultures and stuff. What are some of the practical challenges uh, that you face in reaching this next generation? I think uh, that's a great question because I think that's sometimes what we want to get our the handle on. But I think if you look at this generation and you listen to them, uh, we, have, we raised two millennials, my wife and I. We have two sons, and so I listen to them, and I watch them. And not everything they do and think is, do I agree with? Oh, that's a great idea. I'm like, are you sure you want to do that? Uh, they were raised on the mission field, great kids. But, but this generation, listen, the thing we have in common, wherever, whatever country or culture you're in, is that we're tied together by common needs. We're not maybe tied together by common practices, but the one thing we're confident, we're sure of, is we all work from the same basic set of needs. So I can go anywhere in the world and realize we need to eat today, we need to sleep today, we need to breathe and drink water today. And in the same way, we have a need to be reconnected with God. We have a hunger for community. We have a hunger for, for reality and truth and, and, and peace in our lives. And so that's a great starting point. You see what I'm saying? That's to the, to the millennials, they have the same needs that we have. <laughs> but they just, the form is different. You're not going to find a ton of millennials at, 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 at the big buffets. You know what I mean? Uh, hometown buffet. You're, you're just not going to go in there and see just a ton of millennials at hometown buffet. If I gave a millennial, a, a, hey, thanks for your help. Here's a certificate, the hometown buffet. It's like, no, there's not. You're going to give them some random sushi place in a basement somewhere in a back alley, and they're going to be, oh, that's just awesome, right? <laughs> and so, again, is we have a common set of needs. We have an incredible platform already, but we have to begin to listen to them because they're the ones that are, that are coming behind us. And so uh, they have an opinion, but they, they're waiting to be, I think they're waiting to be asked sincerely about that opinion. So how do we experience, or I should say experiment, with methodology without compromising mm -hmm. our message? I think this is the one you hear the most uh, about, and that's kind of what Phyllis was referring to. Um, in, in our fellowship, in our church, 
we've been so blessed with, I want to say, without a doubt, the hardest working people, the people that volunteer the most hours, the people that come up with the best ideas are all in their 20s in our fellowship. Our, our church is literally led with the, with the, some people look at me and go, like, I am not a hipster. I don't have enough hair to be a hipster, man. I don't have enough. It's like, but for some reason, uh, these have, have, we've allowed these guys to step up. And uh, an interesting maybe example would be, um, uh, Ray is our one of our. He's our tech director here. He's in our front row. Came up to spend the day with us. And um, uh, five, four or five years ago, you know, Ray very kindly just came up and said, "Hey, uh, would you mind if I kind of tinkered with your, you know, your, your media stuff?" And and uh, by tinkered, he meant let's sell everything we have and buy entirely new <laughs> <laughs> equipment <laughs> with all new operating systems and. Uh, and as he explained it to me, I realized he knew enough to know, I can trust this guy, he knows what he's doing, and we turned him loose. Well, that wasn't an easy pill to swallow for everybody else, all the, all the middle-aged people who had been running our media and been perfectly content with PowerPoint. PowerPoint works. It's worked forever. Why do you want to change it? You know, why, why do we need to learn that new stuff? I mean, that's literally what we had to work with. We literally had to work, I had to work with 50-year-olds who, who began to just kind of just I don't know, pout and stomp their feet about this. And I kept saying, listen, it's going to be great. It's going to be good. Trust me, it's going to be. And, 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 but Ray just went out and we got the equipment. We did, did away with all the other stuff. And we put in a, an operating system and, and software that works incredibly better. Now those guys are like, man, that was the best decision we ever made. It's like, <laughs> if I remember right, you weren't in on that. Uh, and... And our noise level goes up. Our, 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 it gets fuzzy around the edges. Uh, we're not, we, we do several things in our services and outside that we try to promote community. Again, they're hungry for community. Listen, uh, millennials are hungry for community. They're hungry for authenticity. So we should ask ourselves the questions. And they're, and they're hungry for truth. So we should ask ourselves the questions. Again, what do we sound like and look like? And what does our version of community look like? And is it congruent with what the, those felt needs are? Isn't that, isn't that the philosophy of a good missionary? I don't go there telling them what I think they need. I go there asking questions, and then I prepare the message to fit that need. Now, that doesn't mean we're compromising the message, but it could very much mean we change the methodology, right? The message doesn't change, but the methodology, so technology and uh, at our particular fellowship, Pastor Jason and I, our, our associate, uh, we, we team teach a lot. We're up here just like Lee and I are this morning, and we, we, uh, we banner back and forth. We, we love having women on the platform. Uh, we love, I love having people share, even if I don't totally agree with everything they say. I mean, I like to stir the pot. We want to wrestle with doubt. Doubt is a huge thing in this culture right now. Uh, I, was, I, was, I was listening to a conversation, and a, a man of God that I respect said to another individual here, he said, man, I've been a Democrat all my life. I've been voting Democrat, and, and God's going to, and, 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 you know, you're just like, oh, is that true? Could that be possible? And, um, but we have to listen. Listen, come on, God's bigger than all this. And if we just shut it down, if we just leave no room for conversation, even when it's uncomfortable and messy, the whole thing of same-sex attraction, listen, hello, good morning, you have to deal with this. You have to begin to, I'm not saying embrace it unilaterally, but I'm saying we have to begin to wrestle together with this. And if we just stand up there and blast it off the, off the face of, of, the, of the platform, we We've just shut off, shut off an, an, a whole segment of our culture that uh, they don't know what they believe exactly. They're listening to the media. We're, we're trying to pastor people through seasons of deep doubt and, and, and restructuring re the whole churning of our society. So I just can't say, hey, just come into the confines of this safe sanctuary and just listen to some pre-prepared gospel that we want you to believe without thinking. So it takes time. It takes listening. And it takes some real, sometimes listening to stuff, you're like, oh, I just want to shake your head. But I want to listen because they want to wrestle with it. They really do. I want to say they really, millennials want to wrestle with their doubts. So that has to be okay, obviously, that they can wrestle with their doubts. Mm -hmm. Could you talk to us a little bit about maybe some practical ways that the church functions outside of the, the four walls? Because I know that you guys are involved in schools, you're involved in different mm -hmm. things, and I think that that is a 
key part of because one of the things I see with millennials is they want to know what you're doing, just practical humanitarian yeah. type efforts in the community. Can you talk to us about that? You know, isn't it interesting, uh, again, the, um, the attraction in this culture right now among millennials to, hey, let's change the world. Come on, I don't want to just sit there and listen to doctrine. I just, we want to go out and let's do something that makes a difference. Let's, let's give away food. Let's, uh, let's put the homeless in, in homes and, and all those things are great things. You know, the book of James is very interesting. The book of James says, pure religion is this, to take care of the widows and the orphans and those who are in distress and to keep yourself pure and unpolluted from the world. Isn't that interesting that those two things in this, this symbiotic relationship of the social gospel, what we would call, oh, that's all that liberal left-wing church stuff, you know. They're all feeding the poor and stuff, but they don't preach the gospel and their sexuality is all, all messed up. And, and here we are, the evangelicals, that we got the gospel all pure, but eh, we don't really do a lot outside the, outside the walls of the church. Somewhere in the middle there is, is the gospel. <laughs> Somewhere in there is James that says we, we do both. And so as a church, we've tried to push these guys outside, and, and that kind of goes back to, to leadership, that we help, we, we want to encourage them, like, hey, what, is, what should this look like for you guys? What does the outreach look like for you? Um, what does ownership feel like for you? And there's no end to what we could be doing out there. There's plenty of needs in every, in every community. We, we mentor in the public schools across the streets from our campuses. We, we work with, uh, we partner with organizations. Unity is another big thing in, in this culture of, hey, can't we just all work together? And um, so we try to partner with people outside our tribe, the assemblies. I love the assemblies. I was saved here. I've been in the assemblies most of my life. But man, there's a whole bunch of really cool stuff going on outside of our tribe. And if we, get, if we can reach outside there and connect, we do a thing, Ray is on our core team besides our tech, Ray actually serves on the core team of our young adult group. And uh, we have a thing in Salem called The Spot, and there's about a half a dozen or 10 churches that get together, and we, they just get together and worship. They just get together and pray during the summer once a month. And they just kind of inter interact with one another. But, but this thing of honestly letting go of leadership, and, and honestly saying, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you not just responsibility, but I'm going to give you authority. And then working in the mentoring piece. How much time do we have? What do we? Millennials are hungry for authentic mentoring relationships. They're hungry for authentic mentoring relationships. What I mean by that is it's a mentoring relationship is an agreement between two people. That as a mentor, I have something worth handing off, something worth investing in. As a mentee, you're going to pay the price, whatever that price is, to receive that from me. And we're in a very critical season right now where all of us 50-somethings or 60-somethings, we have years of ministry and experience and understanding under our belt. And we are poised to hand off some amazing stuff to the next generation. If we would resist the temptation just to figure out a way to retire at 61 and, and go build wind chimes on the ocean for the next 12 years or something like that. And in my church, it's been such a struggle to challenge my 50-somethings. My would you stop and imagine how you could sow your life into the next generation if you would just make those agreements and, and make those commitments and take that time? Oh, these kids don't want to hear what I have to hear. Oh, yes, they do. Oh, yes, they do. But you have to slow down, and you have to begin to learn that language. You're, you, see what, you see what I'm saying? You know, I was in a, a meeting years ago in, in, in South America, and there was a meeting of a bunch of South American leaders of organizations, very prestigious, very, uh, they were godly men. And there was a bunch of North Americans in the room, and the North Americans were there as partners. And um, Oftentimes, North Americans will show up in those situations, and they're at the power seat because they generally will have the money. And they were talking, these North Americans were around this table with these Latins, and they were talking about, hey, they were, they were working on some big project, and, they, and the one guy, in good and sincere faith and, and kindness, said to a Brazilian brother, he said, brother, we want to we wanna invite you, our, our brothers, our Latin brothers, to the table to help us in forming this organization. And this Brazilian man, very smart, very humble, 
and he sat there for a second. You could tell he wanted to say something, but he, there's an honor thing of he had to be invited. And I said, so, hey, what are you thinking right now, Jerson? He said, well, I appreciate, he said. Uh, I appreciate being invited to the table. But is there a way we could have a hand in helping build the table? You hear, you hear the difference there? You see? See, one, one version is help us do what we've already planned and decided to do. The other version is we can learn from you on how to do this. So we, we want to invite you. Help us build this table together. Listen, whether we like it or not, you and I and, and, and most of us in this room, we're going to be off this stage pretty soon. And man, I want to have something when I step off the stage that I don't look back and find that I left this huge gap that's going to be filled by some, some outsider that we had to go hire from somewhere to come in and, and go through three years of awful transition just to get this guy back on track and everybody leaves and a whole new generation, a whole new group of people cycle through the church. We've seen that. I've seen that. That's awful. We don't do transition very well, but we could if we tried. So a lot of our hires, the practical thing, most of our hires are from the inside. We, don't, we, we do very little hire from the outside. I, I'm not saying there aren't people out there. I'm not saying it couldn't work. But for us, we want to grab these people that have just been with us, and we, we pull them alongside, we pull them close, and we make the agreements of discipleship and mentoring, and then we want to release them to help build the table. Because once that sets in, the, the roots are already deep. And, and uh, there's an, if you ask any of our guys, there's an ethos, there's a DNA that is very, very important to us. That we, and I'm not saying that, Listen, uh, you know, a cake consists of a lot of things. And, and so uh, if, if there's a lot of trappings, I mean, I don't care, whatever you want to call it, of uh, style and, 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 uh, and, and the outside environment of whatever, smoke machines or, or loud music or how many people are on your worship team. And that's all, but in my opinion, that's the frosting. And the frosting is part of the cake, but there's not much nutrition in it. What we have to f focus on are what are the main things, and if you want a different kind of frosting and that works in your area, uh, maybe what works in Portland isn't going to work in, in eastern Oregon or south, southern Oregon or whatever in Nebraska, but um, figure out, they're, they're hungry for content. They're hungry for, for the truth. And so we have to be, that's, as, as lead pastors and as I think the senior brothers, we have to be strong in that area. Man, there's so much to... Uh to think about. What I'd like you to do, Bruce, is um, take just a few minutes, and what, what would you say to, as, as pastors, as leaders, particularly pastors, and I realize there's other ministries, and forgive us, we're not trying to exclude you, but, but in the local church, in the local church, what, uh, what would you say would be some first steps towards reaching this next generation for them personally, and maybe helping to transition some of the entrenched leadership, leadership that has been there for years. What, what would be some practical first steps you might suggest? Anything come to your mind? Yeah, um, several things. Um, like I said earlier in the story, uh, begin to really re honestly research your audience. Uh, there's, there is no end to, to great, great stuff out there that we don't have to learn the hard way. Hayden Shaw's book is a, is a, is a good example of that. In, a, in, a, in an hour, you could get a really great snapshot of what is going on in our world. And listen, there are some monumental shifts going on right now in this generation. Every generation struggles, has struggled with sin. Every generation struggles with rebellion and all kinds of, but in this generation in particular, because of the internet, because of, of porn and, and other things, it, it really is a different day, but, but it's, it's not intimidating to God. But we have to be good missionaries. We have to, we have to know what, what's really going on. I don't know about you, but Sundays come really quick for me. They come every seven days faster than I want. And so my whole life can be just caught up in just, just plain just, just survival and catch up. But, but this deliberate research of what's going on in my audience, my mission field, uh, what's going on and what's the demographic in my neighborhoods, what, what, what's the pulse? We're fortunate that right around us we have Willamette University in our city within five minutes, Willamette University, Chemeketa College, and, and Corbin University, three really uh, um, very distinctly different groups, but these groups are just full of millennials, and they visit our church. They critique us. They sit in the back. Corbin is a university, a Christian university there in southern Salem, and, 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 and they just sit in the back and take notes. 
<laughs> and then they come up afterwards and challenge us theologically. Uh, I like that stuff. They ask us tough questions uh, about what's going on in culture and what we're teaching. So I think it's going to cause us to dig in a little bit. You know, one of the things we do is, again, we've listened to what's going on out there. Now, I, I, this is us. I'll speak for me. I can't speak for you, but I, get, I think I would be close. The average millennial, at the top of his list, is not understanding the significance of the tabernacle. I'm sorry. But you know what they want to know? How can, I, how can I stay married? How can I keep my relationship from blowing up? How, 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 how can I do life without hurting myself and hurting other people? Those are, again, the felt needs. Now, there may be a time later in life to do a series on the tabernacle, but whenever I talk to pastors, I'm always asking them, so what are you doing? What's, what series are you doing? Because if that series isn't catching people to the application of the word of God, where people are living, what in the world are we doing? What in the world? We've got to take the word of God and hold it up where people are living. So when I, when I see pastors who, who are teaching these series that, again, preaching to the choir, it's fine, but what is that guy in the back? We, we do a marriage series. Uh, we take 12 weeks a year, and we just, we just go after marriage on Sunday mornings, and, and we talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly, and, and, and we're very frank about what we do, and we actually warn people, hey, listen, we're going to talk about sexuality this morning, and moms get up, and they take their kids out, and, 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 and we, we do it carefully and respectfully, but at the end, people come up, man, this is where I'm living right now. This is my, we talk, we talk about homosexuality. We, 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 we just, where people live, that's where the gospel, that's what Jesus did the best, isn't it? He caught them where they lived. He didn't take them to some theological nirvana out there. He, he caught them where they lived, nitty gritty living. And, and I think what we teach has to, has to reflect that. Am I connecting? I mean, there's a lot of great messages, um, but am I connecting with what people really need in their lives right now? And later on, I'll take them on to the, Maybe the other things, but. Well, good. There's so much more we could go into. One of the things that I love about tending the church there, Bruce, is you guys, you guys emphasize being the church outside of the four walls, mm -hmm. and then you give them practical tools of how they can do it. I think that's a good place to end, and I think it's a lesson for all of us. And I want to say thank you for what you're doing there. It's been a win for the Oregon Ministry Network. Mm -hmm. It was a, it was a, uh, a risky endeavor it seemed like you guys were kind of the first pack type arrangement we did in the state and now a few years later we're seeing hundreds where there were uh only a dozen and uh, god is god is moving and i want to say thank you to you and linda yeah. and thank you for taking the time to invest in us let's let's say thank yeah. you to bruce